Hello, I'm Kendall Mitchell and today I'll be performing two monologues for you. My first monologue is going to be Jean's monologue from the show His Luck, written by Horace Holly. My second monologue is going to be Imogen's monologue from the play written by Shakespeare, Cymbeline. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to watch this and I hope you enjoy. You ask it, of course. You have the right. Sometimes I ask it too, but Paul never succeeded. All along while we were struggling, I thought the things that held him back were just mere details. Only now do I see as a whole that in the first place, Paul never directly aimed at success. He was all around. <laughs> If it had merely been a question of exploiting his talent and sticking to one idea day in and day out and never letting an opportunity slip by of, of being in the right places or meeting the right people, I mean, that would have been easy. <laughs> he had tremendous energy. I used to grudge his interest in other things. I just hated to see him lose opportunity and chances and let them be snapped up by littler men. He just seemed to waste himself left and right prodigally. But it wasn't that. It wasn't waste. It was all much a part of him as music was. And he detested the stupidity of, of wealth and poverty, and he rebelled against laws that aren't even laws, but merely interests enforced by authority, and, and how he went against the sheer deadness of prejudice, and how he hated all of that. And why not hate all of it? You see, Vera, he wasn't only sensitive as a thinker, but as a musician too. <laughs> he used to say that the beauty of music is only in the image of the beauty of life, and that life must come first. <laughs> Away! I do condemn my ears that have so long attested to thee. <laughs> if thou were honorable, Thou would have told this tale for virtue, and not seekest a basis strange. Thou wrongst a gentleman who is as far from thy report as thy is from honorability and socialist. A lady that disdains thee and the devil alike. <laughs> what hope, Bastanio? The king, my father, shall be made acquainted of thy assault if he so shink it fit. A saucy stranger in his court to mart? as in a beastly Romish too, to expose his beastly mind to us. <laughs> he hath a court he little care for, and a daughter he not respect at all. What ho, Pistanio? Thank you for your time today. Hi, I'm Mona Kiani, and my monologues are Marianne's monologue from Tartuffe by Moliere, and Renee's monologue from Kodachrome by Adam Simkowitz. Father, I beg you, in the name of heaven that knows my grief and by whatever can move you, relax a little your paternal rights and free my love from disobedience. Oh, do not make me by your harsh command complain to heaven you ever were my father. Do not make wretched this poor life you gave me, and if crossing that fond hope which I had formed, you'll not permit me to belong to one whom I have dared to love. At least, I beg you, upon my knees, oh, save me from the torment of being possessed by one whom I abhor, and do not drive me to some desperate act by exercising all of your rights upon me. Hi. This is weird. Hi. I wanted to... I don't know what. I, I saw Charlie. I went to see Charlie. I mean... Wow, this is hard. Suzanne. I... Well, I guess I came for your blessing? I know we were never what you'd call the best of friends. Not that we... I don't have any animosity. I understood. I wanted good things for you, better than what happened. And I mean that, I'm not bitter, I'm resigned. I have my tea, I have my books, I'm not complaining. I don't want an exciting life. Excitement has never been my 
but that's not what I came to say. Uh, it's been a long time when I let him go all those years ago. And I guess what I'm saying is I want him back. Which means I have to get to know who he's become, but I can't do that if I don't feel like it's okay with you. So I've come to formally make peace so that he and I can... What am I saying? <laughs> he doesn't want me. He has his own life, his own ways. I... It won't work. Stuck in our well-worn grooves. He doesn't need more love. The love you had for him was enough for life, wasn't it? I'm sorry to bother you. Rest peacefully. Sorry. I'm on Kiani. Thank you. Hi, I'm Noah Sorrell, and my monologues are Allegra from Pretty Theft by Adam Simkowicz and Aileen from A Marriage Has Been Arranged by Alfred Sutro. I know you're probably mad at me for leaving before the funeral, but I just can't do it. My whole body itches and it won't stop until I get in that car and I can't see this house or this town or this state from the rear view window. This way is better. This way I'll come back from my trip and go straight to school and you won't have to look at me or think about me. You can tell people you have a daughter, but you won't have to talk to me on the phone or see me on the couch. I'll be a no maintenance daughter, just like you always wanted. But now I'm going to get in that car and push you out of my mind until I get to the Grand Canyon or some other fairly good canyon. And maybe I'll cry in front of the mammoth orange hole in the ground. Or maybe I'll smile. Because it's so beautiful and I'm free and windswept. See, I will give you confidence for confidence. This is, as you suggest, my ninth season. Living in an absurd milieu where marriage with a wealthy man is regarded as the one aim in life. I have, during the past few weeks, done all that I can to bring a proposal from you. Perhaps the knowledge that other women were doing the same lent a little zest to the pursuit, which otherwise would have been very dreary, for I confess that your personality did not especially appeal to me. Indeed, this being the palace of truth, I will admit that it was only by thinking hard of your three millions that I have been able to conceal the wariness I have felt in your society. I, of course, have been debarred from the disreputable amours on which you linger so fondly. Further, I am 28. I have always been poor. I hate poverty, for it has soured me no less than you. Dress is the thing in life I care for most. Vulgarity, my chief abomination, and to be frank, you are the most vulgar person I have ever met. And now, will you marry me, Mr. Croxted? Thank you. Hi, I'm Bert Daniel. Today I will be performing Kane's monologue from Kane, A Mystery by Lord Byron, and Steve's monologue from Fat Cat Killers by Adam Sinkowitz. <sighs> they have but one answer to all questions. Twas his will, he is good. How know I that? Because he is all-powerful, must all good to follow? I judge but by the fruits, and they are bitter, which I must feed on, for a fault not mine. Why do I exist? Why are all things wretched, even he who made us be as the maker of things unhappy? To produce destruction! can surely never be the task of joy, and yet my sire says he's omnipotent. Why, why is evil he being good? I ask this question of my father, who says, evil only was the path to good, strange good that must arise from outs, its deadly opposite. I lately saw 
a lamb stung by a reptile, the poor sucker, they lay foaming beneath a vein and piteous bleeding of its restless dam. <laughs> My father plucked some herbs and laid them to the wound, and by degrees the helpless wretch rose to resume its careless life, rose to drain its mother's milk, who over it tremulous stood licking its reviving limbs with joy. Behold, said Adam, how from evil springs good. I thought that were a better portion for the animal never to have been stung at all than to purchase renewal of its little life with agonies unutterable, though dispelled by antidotes. I would like to call on the leniency of the jury, not because I didn't know what I was doing. I knew what I was doing. Although, please keep in mind, it was not actually me who killed Dave. I didn't shoot him or anything like that. I may be an accessory to murder, but a minor accessory. Like, what's a minor accessory? Like a beret. It's true. I helped keep him hostage, but I had a good reason for all my actions. Revenge. Revenge is, I believe, a good reason to do things that may get you arrested. But my hope is that you, my peers, understand and appreciate the value of revenge because when it comes down to it, all of my actions were motivated by revenge. When you, when you take away a man's ability to support himself, don't you, don't you expect him to fight back? So I did. Murder might have been too strong a way to fight back, but I hope you all understand my impulses, if not the severity of my actions. Thank you. I'm Burke Tenniel. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lisa Bierbach, and my monologues are The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde and the Jack and Jill Plays by Adam Simkowitz. Cecily, I'm surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember that constant anxiety about that young man, his brother. I do not believe that I could produce such an effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irritably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I'm not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I'm not in favor of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I don't see why you should carry a diary at all. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary we all carry about with us. Don't interrupt. I want to be with someone who likes me for the things I like about myself, too. Or the things they like I don't even know. Like, am I funny? Maybe someone who thinks I'm really funny. And someone who likes the color, color of my hair. Like that. When I talk, you don't understand me. I say something and your mind drifts and I know you're not really smart enough to get me. I'm pretty sure there are some great things about me, but if I stay with you, I'll never know because I'll see myself the way you see me. I'll get stuck there. Because you're kind of overbearing in your worldview. And I don't think you really see me. Or you do, but in a blurry way. You see me out of the corner of your eye, and so you have this general idea, but you never really see me because you can't stop putting things on top of me that aren't really me. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jackson Statham. Today I'm Sam from the play East Haddon by Adam Skowitz and Romeo from the play Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. How to be alone. It's really not that hard. You just don't date anyone. That makes it easier to not accidentally get into a relationship, which Makes it easier to not move in with anyone or marry them. I eat a lot of soup, 
I recommend that. I mean, you can really dress however you want. Shower or don't. I used to go to the gym, but I don't do that anymore. Some days, I only eat cookies. I like to read a lot and watch a lot of TV, and sometimes I drink tea, but you should do you. I mean, that's what it's all about, really. Being the person you want to be without caring about what other people think. I have a job. I go to work, and I do my work, and I go home, and then I do whatever I want. So I've really got a maid. Loneliness? Yeah. I mean, sure, that can happen sometimes. I recommend alcohol. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I don't recommend it, but I use it. What else? I have friends? I usually shower before seeing them, but it's optional. Also, we can do pine after someone completely unattainable. I do that. I've done that. I mean, I've been doing that for basically years. What else? Did I mention reading? I like why sci-fi fiction and fantasy, but again, you do you. <laughs> now, I'm gonna go dance with the unicorn. Any questions? But soft, what light though yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief. That thou, her maid, art far more fair than she, being her not her maid, since she is envious, her vestal livery but sick and green. And none but fools do wear it. Cast it off, it is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eyes discourses. I'll answer it. I'm too bold. <sighs> Tis not me she speaks. Two of the fairest stars in all of heaven, having some business, do entreat her eyes to twinkle in the spears till they return. What if her eyes were there? They in her head. The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars as daylight doth her lamp. Her eyes in heaven would, through the airy region, stream so bright that birds would sing and think it were the night. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand, that I may touch that cheek. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adriana Heffron, and I will be performing Donna's monologue from Three Judgments in a Blow and Marabella's monologue from Fat Kids on Fire. This is my story, sir. This is the crime. The guilt of which being wholly mine, be mine. I, pleading on my knees, my love to both my husband and my sister as some excuse. Pedro of Aragon, who the people call the just, be just to me. I ask not for mercy, but for justice. And that whatever the punishment may be, may it be told of me and put on record. And that however so, and, and with what design, it may be told of me. And although I might deceive my husband and the world, at least I have not shamed my birth and honor. My name is Maribella Samantha Jones, and this is my stage name. We do a musical every summer here, and I've gotten a lot better than last year. See, last year we did Fiddler, and I was Mama, and we set it on Neptune, and the farmers were like these post-human life amoebas, and... I gotta get to rehearsal for the musical. Yeah, I got a part and I have a whole song too that's all my own and well, I was wondering if maybe you'd come see the show and all because, you know, I'm in it and all and well, I don't know, I just thought it'd be cool if you came. Um, but seating's uh, limited, so uh, if you wanted to, I could make a reserve sign and uh, put it on a seat for you in the front. So, uh, you're coming, right? <laughs> I mean, we'll talk closer to, I mean, house left or house right? I'll start to get the gist of which mm, sight lines better. All right, bye. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ryan St. Martin, and I will be performing a monologue from Up Here by Liz Flave and a monologue from Twelfth Night by Shakespeare. You know, I wrote you that song. I wrote it because when I see you, normally everything's just, just a mess. 
and when I think about you, I can't breathe, and when I look at you, you don't look real. You look like, like if someone were to say, hey, can you draw a picture of a girl, and I drew a picture of you, and they'd be like, hey, that's a really good drawing of a girl. You're a really good artist. Hands get all shaky when I want to touch you. And do you know that great hollow feeling you get when you've been thinking about someone for so long and you turn the corner and there they are and it's like... And the bottom drops out. And it feels like I have no actual mass or dimension and it's like, I'm seeing you after thinking about you that much because at the same time, you were thinking about me and that's how we ended up in the exact same place at the exact same time, by thinking about each other that much. Do you need a ride? If it's true that music makes people more in love, keep playing. Give me too much of it so I'll get sick of it. Stop loving. Play that part again. Ooh, it sounded sad. It sounded like a, like a sweet breeze blowing gently over a bank of violets taking their scent with it. Stop. That's enough. It doesn't sound as sweet as it did before. Oh, love is so restless. It makes you want everything, but it makes you sick of things a minute later. Love is so vivid and fantastical that nothing compares to it. Thank you. I am Lainey Pulliam, and I'd like to perform monologues for Make Believe by Kristen Anna Froberg and with this drawing by Eric Sophonies. Where are you going? Tasha, come on, think about it. Nobody wants you to go out there. They'd be watching through their fingers because everybody knows what's gonna happen. The same thing that happens every time you think you like some guy. Really, Tasha? You're the smart one for a reason. Plus, look at yourself. But maybe you just feel so good about everything. You do so fabulous on the test. Then what? Then you go far away to some big, exciting school in some really big, exciting place. Except you hate exciting places and you've never been on a plane because you're afraid and they crash and you've never actually had a boyfriend, Tasha. How are you gonna know what to do? You never know what to do. You always say and do the exact thing you wish you had in five seconds after and then spend hours and hours thinking about it. How are you gonna be around people? You hate people. You always needed me to make everything happen for you, and I did my best, and it still wasn't enough. You forget I know what the inside of your head looks like. I don't know how you think you're going to do any of these big, exciting things without me. Be calm, then, and I'll go ahead. All the long years when the hopeless war dragged along, we, unassuming, forgotten, and quiet, endured without question all of your child's antics and riot. Our lips we kept tied, though aching with silence. Though all the while we knew how wretchedly everything was still progressing by listening dumbly the day long to you. For always at home, you continue discussing the war and its politics. And sometimes we would ask you, our hearts deep with sorrowing, though lightly we spoke, though happy to see, What's to be inscribed on the side of the treaty stone? What dear was said in the assembly today? Mind your own business, he'd answer me growling. Hold your tongue, woman, or else go away. And so I would hold it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Estella Romero, and I will be performing Julia's monologue from Two Gentlemen of Verona and Linda's monologue from A Beautiful Day. 
and she shall thank you for it. If ever you know a virtuous gentlewoman, mild and beautiful. I hope my master's suit will be but cold since she respects my mistress' love so much. Alas, how can love trifle with itself? Here is her picture. Let me see. I think if I had such a tire, this face of mine were full as lovely as this of hers. And yet, the painter flattered her a little too much. Unless I flattered myself a little too much. Her hair is auburn. Mine is perfect yellow. If that'll be such a difference in his love, I'll get myself a colored periwig. Ay, but her forehead's low and mine is high. What should it be that he respects in her? Look at me. Go on. Take a good look. Do you see me? I'm a woman, not a man. My whole life I've been told that I look like a man, and I don't think I've ever received a compliment regarding my looks as a woman. I think we all have a crush to bear in life. We each have a pain that we need to go exist with. For me, it's my looks. I wrote a letter today and sent it out on that television show that does makeovers, you know, the show Beautiful Day. Well, I wrote a passionate letter to those folks in hopes of getting a makeover, and all I ask is for one day to look beautiful. Sure, I know those books that talk about if you're beautiful on the inside, you must be beautiful on the outside. My friends and family tell me a similar notion, but honestly, let's face it, I'm an ugly duckling. Oh, and I've tried just about everything under the sun that I could possibly get my hands on. You name virtually any damn women's care product, and I've either tried it or read about it. But honestly, some days I look at those women in movies like Julia Roberts and Audrey Hepburn and just real classy, beautiful women, and I sometimes I wish I were them. If I could be beautiful on the outside for a day, that'll be my beautiful day. I'm Paige Setzer, and I will be doing a monologue from the show Phaedra by Racine. <laughs> Anguish yet untried, for what new tortures am I still reserved? All I have undergone, transports of passion, longings, and fears, the horrors of remorse, and the shame of being spurned with contumely. They were all me a feeble foretaste of my current torments. They love each other. By what secret charms have they deceived me? When and where and how met they? And you, you knew it all. Why was I cozened? You never told me of those stolen hours of amorous converse. Have they oft been seen talking together? Did they seek the shade of the thickest woods? Alas, full freedom they had to see each other. The heaven approved of their sighs. They loved without the consciousness of guilt. Every morning sun for them shone clear, while I, an outcast in the face of nature, shunned the bright day and sought to hide myself. Death was the only God whose aid I dared to ask. I waited for the grave's release, watered with tears, nourished with gall. But my woe was all too closely watched, and I did not dare to weep without restraint. In my mortal dread, tasting this dangerous solace, I sought to hide my terrors neath a tranquil countenance. And oft I had to check my tears and smile. I'm Paige Setzer, and this is a monologue from the Miss Firecracker Contest by Beth Henley. Popeye's using this red material to make my costume for the Miss Firecracker contest. You see, I just registered today. Elaine was Miss Firecracker way back when she was just 18. She was such a vision of beauty riding up on that float with that crown on her head, waving to everyone. Man, I just thought that I would drop dead when she passed by me. Anyway, I just thought that, you know, maybe I could give it a whirl. I mean, I'm 24, 25's the age limit. I just thought that I'd give it a go while I still could. Of course I don't expect to win. That's crazy. I'm just in it for the experience. That's the main thing. That's also the reason why I dyed my hair red. I thought it'd be more appropriate for the contest. Hey, did you bring that dress along with you that I asked you about on the phone? You know, that beautiful red antebellum dress that you wore at the Natchez pilgrimage the first year you got married? See, it's gonna be perfect for me to wear in the contest. I'm trying to make crimson red my thematic color. I'll just need them in the actual contest for the opening parade of firecrackers. Pardon me. Why do you think that I should wait until after the audition to see if I make the pageant? Don't you think I'll make it? Well, I, I know they only pick five girls and see, I've thought about it. And frankly, I cannot think of five other girls in this town that are prettier than me. 
I mean, of course I know there's Caroline Jeffers, but she's got them yellow teeth. I, I know why you're worried. It's because you think I've ruined my chances with my reputation and all. Well, everyone knows that I used to go out with lots of men and all that. Different ones. It's been a constant thing with me since I was young. I mean, I just mention it because it's different now since Aunt Rennell died and since I got that uh, disease. But anyway, I, I go to church now. I'm signed up where I take an orphan home to dinner once a week or to a movie. I, I work at the cancer drive just like you do in Natchez. My life has meaning. People aren't calling me Miss Hot Tamale anymore like they used to. Everything has changed. Being in that contest. It would be such an honor to me. I can't even explain the half of it. Now I know I'm not all that ugly. I just wish you had about a drop of faith in me. Thank you. I'm Minna Hamilton. I'll be performing monologues from The Search for Signs of Intelligent Life of the Universe by Jane Wagner and Eurydice by Sarah Rule. And now since I put reality in the back burner, my days are jam-packed and fun-filled. Like, some days I just hang around 7th Avenue. I love to do this joke. I wait for some music tourists from the nearby hotels in Central Park to come down and ask the locals, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And then I run in and I yell, practice! The look on their faces is priceless. I could have never done that stuff when I was in my right mind. I mean, I would be too worried. People would think I was crazy. When I think of all the fun I missed, I try not to get bitter. See, the mind is like a pinata. When you break it open, there's a lot of surprises inside. Once you get in that pinata perspective, you see that losing your mind is just a peak experience. There was a roar and a coldness. I think my husband was with me. What was my husband's name? Do you remember? How strange, I don't remember. It was horrible to see his face when I died. His eyes were like two black birds and they flew to me. I said, no, stay where you are. He needs you to see. When I got through the cold, they made me swim in a river and I forgot his name. I forgot all the names. I know his name begins with my mouth in the shape of like a ball of twine. Or, or, I forget. They took me to a tiny boat. I only just fit inside. I looked at the oar and I wanted to cry. I tried to cry, but I just drooled a little. I'll try it now. happiness it would be to cry. I was not lonely, only alone with myself, begging myself to not leave my own body. But I was leaving. Goodbye, head, I said. It inclined a little, as though to nod to me in a solemn kind of way. How do you say goodbye to yourself? Hi, my name is Ben Blight, and I will be performing a monologue from Bang Bang You're Dead by William Matrosomi. Mom? Dad? You made me do this. I wanted to kill you, but I didn't want you dead. How else could I tell you what was on my mind without you interrupting? Mom? How are you singing now if you're dead? Stop it! You used to sing me that song when I couldn't sleep. Stop it, please! 
don't I have enough pain? Isn't it enough that everybody looks at me like I'm a broken trash bag? I mean, where do I fit in? Where can I go and not have anybody on my back? At school, the teachers are giving this test and that paper. And don't do this and don't do that. And then I come home and you always find something I didn't do. I'm never good enough. I guess I'm just sick of being disappointed, of you being disappointed in me all the time. Thank you. Oh. Come, sir, the salute. Your body's straight, leaning slightly on your left thigh, your legs not so wide apart, feet in a line, your wrist in a line with your hip, the point of your sword to the level of your shoulder, the arm not so extended, your left hand at the level of your eye, your left shoulder further back, your head up, a bold expression. Advance. Your body steady. Engage my sword from the fourth position and thrust forward. One, two, recover. Again, your foot firmly on the ground. Leap back. When you make a thrust, sir, you must first disengage and your body must not be exposed. One, two, come. Be at third position and thrust. Advance. Stop there. One, two, recover. Repeat. Leap back. On guard, sir, on guard. Hi, I'm Jetta Thompson, and my monologues are Jill's monologue from Butterflies Are Set Free and Margaret's monologue from Fanny's First Play. You're thinking, I don't look like a divorcee. They're usually around 35 with tight-fitting dresses, high heel patent leather boots, and big boobs. I look more like a kid in a custody fight. I can't talk about Jack. No, I'll talk about him. It's good for you to do something you don't want to every once in a while. It cleanses the mind. He was awfully sweet and groovy looking. Kind of adolescent, if you know what I mean. Girls mature faster than boys. Boys are neater, but girls mature faster. When we met, it was like fireworks. I don't know if what I'm saying is right, but it was a marvelous kind of passion that made every day feel like the 4th of July. Anyway, the next thing I knew, we were standing in front of a justice of peace getting married. I hadn't even finished high school. I had two exams the next day, and they were on my mind. And the next thing I heard was, do you, Jack, take Jill to be your lawfully wedded wife? Can you imagine going through life as Jack and Jill? And then I heard, till death do you part, and suddenly, I wasn't at a wedding ceremony anymore. I was at a funeral service. You know, wedding ceremonies are really morbid when you think about that. And I hate anything morbid. And there I was, being buried alive under Jack Benson. I wanted to go screaming, running out in the middle of the night, but it was 10 o'clock in the morning. You can't exactly go running, screaming out at 10 o'clock in the morning. So I passed out. If only I fainted before I said I do. I am not hardened, mother, but I cannot talk nonsense about it. You see, it's all real to me. I've suffered it. I've been shoved and bullied. I've been made to scream with pain in other ways. I've been flung into a filthy cellar full of a lot of other poor wretches. But the only difference between me and the others was that I fought back. <laughs> I hit back and I did worse. I wasn't ladylike. I cursed. I said names. I heard words I didn't even know I knew coming out of my mouth as if someone else were saying them. The policeman repeated them in court. The magistrate said he could hardly believe it. The only thing that gave me satisfaction was that smack right in his mouth. And I said it. I will never find the happiness that you have. I, I haven't found it yet, but I have found strength. For good or for evil, I am set free. And none of the things that used to hold me can hold me now. Thank you. Hi, 
My name is Davis Hayes, and I will be performing a monologue from Oh Beautiful by Teresa Rebeck and from Much Ado About Nothing as Benedict. This is what I don't understand. Why things come out of your mouth that... You don't know why they're coming out of your mouth. Like, there's a person inside you, right? I mean, if that person isn't you, then who is that person? And who is the person who decides things like, Oh, I'll just do this stupid thing and it'll be okay. Like, oh, beautiful. Like, you think I'll sing this song and it'll be scary, but kind of cool. A cool, good thing to do. Like, honestly, right now, even just talking about it, it seems like such a stupid idea. Such a colossal... Who would ever think that was a good idea? And then when the words that come out aren't even the right words, it's like, who is the person in here making up these words? God, you know, in front of the whole... I mean, it's like this. People say high school sucks and that sort of is supposed to make it okay. Because everybody knows it sucks. But then you look around and realize high school doesn't actually suck for everyone. Why can't I be one of the people that it doesn't suck for? I do much wonder how one man seeing how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviors to love, will become the argument of his own scorn by falling in love. And such a man is Claudio. I have known when there was no music with him but the drum and the fife, and now he had rather hear the tabor and the pipe. His words are a very fantastical banquet, just so many strange dishes. May I be so converted and see with these eyes? I cannot tell. I think not. I will not be sworn. One woman is fair, yet I am well. Another is wise, yet I am well. Another virtuous, yet I am well. But till all graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come in my grace. Rich she shall be, that's certain. Uh, wise, or I'll none, virtuous, or I'll never cheat in her, fair, or I'll never look on her, of good discourse, an excellent musician, and her hair shall be... Of what color it please God. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emma Farina, and I'll be performing Alyssa's monologue from the monologue show from Hell, and Jane's monologue from Las Cruces. Isn't it funny how the voices in your head talk to you sometimes? I have two, actually. My first one, well, my favorite one, is Taylor Swift. I know, right? Crazy! It is so great having Taylor Swift in my head, though. She's always like, you're a strong woman, and don't you forget it. <laughs> I love her! It's like she's sitting on my shoulder and telling me things like, shake it off all the time. It is magical. Then I imagine taking Taylor home and showing her my life like this is it and she'll be like yay your life is so awesome we're such good friends but sometimes <laughs> I worry that Taylor is getting bored because you know I'm just like an ordinary person right I'm not some big fancy star or whatever and I know she says nice things about my clothes but She's probably thinking, like, no one even designed this. I can't believe you're wearing this. Is this from The Gap? Who wears clothes from The Gap? So that's when I like to thrill her. So this one time, I went to Macy's, and I was like, Taylor, what would you do if I shoplifted this sweater right now? And Taylor Swift got all worried, and she was like, no, don't shoplift. And I was like, okay. So instead, I went to the counter, and there was this nice lady there, and she was like, can I help you? And I made my eyes go all crazy, and I faked having a gun, and I was like, give me all the money now! <laughs> oh my god. Taylor was freaking out. It was so funny. So... I tied the lady up with a scarf or whatever, and I grabbed the cash, and I was like, run! And there's a security guard chasing me, and I just, I grabbed this mannequin and smashed him over the head with it. Boom! <sighs> He's like, 
unconscious and bleeding or whatever and the alarm sounds like woo woo it was so fun taylor was not bored she was screaming her little taylor swift scream and let me tell you it still sounded beautiful she's an angel <laughs> anyways we get in my car and there's that little small security vehicle chasing us it's like a smart car or whatever like three feet long i floor it smash head first into it and i'm screaming i am insane do not mess with me it was hilarious the security guard was like crying or whatever he was like i have kids and a family <laughs> then i tear out of there before the cops show up and i told taylor i am never going to let you be bored with me <laughs> and i think she really liked that she's going to be so surprised by what i do next <sighs> no in answer to your questions, we never had any warnings. Our son was 17, don't you think we'd notice? I'm sorry, could I just, I prefer to answer the questions as written, can we not? Well, they're shouting at me, they're not supposed to. I agreed to answer these specific questions. We didn't know about the pipe bombs. I've never seen a pipe bomb, wherever they were, hidden or how they were made i just i don't know i don't know if you would just ask them to respect this this process i i agreed to answer these questions my lawyer was clear this is all i have to just just these questions he must have bought the ammunition i i don't know he worked at a pizza restaurant that was his money we didn't try to control I never saw the guns. I never saw the bullets or his journals. You don't snoop in your son's room. That's a violation of trust. Do you understand? I'm saying my son would not just go and buy bullets. They were probably all sorts of bad apples in the school. Why are you shouting at me? Why are you shouting at me? I can't, I can't think. You're not letting me think. <laughs>